Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us and tuning in virtually. Um, so tonight we have Mike Davis and John Weiner in conversation with Tom Lutz of Los Angeles West Review of Books. So they're going to discuss Mike and John's new book, Set the Night on Fire, L.A. in the 60s, which is the first comprehensive radical history of L.A. Um, and of this decade. And then we're going to open it up for questions and to talk more about some of the political resonances um, of the book for activists today. So as many of you know, Mike Davis is a longtime Verso author whose books include City of Quartz, Planet of Slums, and Prisoners of the American Dream. Fifteen years ago, he wrote The Monster at Our Door, the first book to raise alarm about a possible avian flu pandemic. John Wiener is his co-author of Set the Night on Fire um, and a longtime contributing editor at The Nation and host and producer of Start Making Sense, the magazine's weekly podcast. He's an emeritus professor at US, of U.S. history at U.S. Irvine, and his books include Gimme Some Truth, The John Lennon FBI Files, and How We Forgot the Cold War, A Historical Journey Across America. And Tom Lutz, is founder and editor-in-chief of the Los Angeles Review of Books and the author of many books himself, including Born Slippy, his recent novel. So Tom, thank you so much for moderating tonight and joining us um, and for championing the book in general. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and yeah, get started. Okay, thanks so much, Julia. Um, uh, we are of course here to talk about Set the Night on Fire, uh, it, which is a monumental, which you can tell from the, the whip, <laughs> monumental history of uh, rebellion and resistance, um, a movement history of Los Angeles, uh, examining black and Chicano and LGBT and women's and student and labor activism in the city. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's an amazing read. Um, and it's um, kind of spiced up uh, in various uh, spots by the fact that uh, both uh, both of our authors, uh, my friends John and Mike, have uh, make cameo appearances in the in the text itself because uh, both of them were there for some of the events that they they talk about. So, um, I, I and today it turns out is a key anniversary um, uh, for an event that's in the book. The Gusanos, the right-wing anti-Castro Cubans, uh, terrorized a number of movement um, uh, organizations and um, and offices, including the LA Free Press, the Socialist Workers Party, Ashgrove Music Club, um, and the Haymarket Movement Center, which is the anniversary. It was the the attack on the Haymarket um, um, Movement Center where Mike was a staffer. Um, John, you said he was the the uh, the the jefe, um, the chief of that uh, of that thing, but, but no, uh, Mike said no. Um, so uh, tell tell us about uh, just as a uh, as a taste of what's in the book um, for starters, Mike. Tell us about uh, what what that event was and how it how it came about. Well, first of all, Tom, thank you for holding the book up like that because <laughs> for the first time. I can brag about the size of something. Uh, <laughs> Haymark was gee, about a quarter mile from Los Angeles City College campus, and it had been started by a collective of, of people organized by a wonderful guy named Roger McCready, uh, who died only a few years after uh, this event. And we were showing uh, a program of Cuban films, and we knew that we would most likely uh, be attacked by Alpha 66, the veterans of the uh, Bay of, uh, of Pigs. And uh, I had to leave the center to go pick up my wife, who's uh, studying for teaching credential at SC. And when I came back, when we drove up to the Hollywood freeway, I could see flames 50, 60 feet in, in the air, I mean, it, was, it, was, it was horrifying. And what had happened is we had a guy on the, uh, on the roof, uh, and he saw the, uh, this group of guys, big burly guys, getting out of the cars. He knew what was 
what was happening, but uh, you decided to act rationally and not uh, attempt to prevent them from entering. So they barged through the door, and they were holding, they had guns, but they were holding uh, cans of oven cleaner. And they sprayed a couple of people in the face with it, including one young guy who, I don't think he'd even been to the, the hay market before. We, it was something like coffee ads, too. He just wandered in from City College. And he would die a month later from uh, the inhalation of, of the oven uh, cleaner. Although we could never get the police to take this up as uh, uh, manslaughter uh, or murder. So they wrapped people up a bit and then set fire to the center. This was, um, as John can relate, this was just one and an interminable number of attacks on coffee houses, other movement centers, uh, the headquarters of the Socialist Workers Party. John, you want to add a bit about what happens next? Well, John, you you, uh, you, you covered it for the operation. <laughs> yeah, I, I had come out here, um, I think, two years before, and my idea was that I, uh, I was writing for the Liberation News Service, which was the... I don't know. The, twice a week, they sent a like a sixty-four page packet to two hundred underground papers around the country of mimeographed reports on what was happening, and I was the L.A. stringer, and so this was this big story from L.A. So I went down there to interview the Haymarket people about uh, what had happened, and of course there was Mike Davis, already quite a prominent and almost legendary figure in the L.A. movement. So I interviewed Mike about this put it into my story for Liberation News Service, and I realized only writing this book, that was the first time I ever met Mike Davis, and it was 50 years ago right now. So, yeah. <laughs> hi, Mike. <laughs> Happy anniversary, John. Thank you. Thank you. 50 years, you say. Oh. And, uh, and Mike, you, you mentioned in, in passing that you had a guy on the roof. I mean, there was, the violence was so pervasive that you needed a lookout at all times? Uh, he wasn't just a lookout. Because uh, we we knew that we would likely be attacked. So uh, people had taken the decision to arm ourselves and to have somebody on, on, on the roof. But he did exactly the right thing by not uh, opening opening up on these these characters because what would have happened then would have been a total massacre they would have killed everybody in fact let, let me say they the LAPD did catch some of them this the most of this chapter is about the the two different times the right wing uh, anti-Castro Cubans tried to burn down the ash grove a legendary folk music club on Melrose uh, the uh, the se the second th same thing um, spray in the face of people who refused to lie down on the floor set fire to the building people managed to escape the people who escaped from the ash grove on Melrose ran outside one of them was a waitress whose father had just dropped her off for work and he happened to be a retired L A fire department captain saw the guys come running out chased them in his own car pulled them over like two blocks from the scene of where the building was now on fire. The LAPD arrested them, uh, booked them. Uh, they got out on bail. There was a big campaign in the Cuban community of Los Angeles to raise their bail. And then they jumped bail, never appeared for trial. And, uh, you know, they're probably, you know, old men in Miami right now. I think they went to Nicaragua for a while for Samosa, didn't they? Could be. Could be. And uh, you know, you you uh, you say that it's a, a movement history, and it's and it is and it's full of stories exactly like that. That is um, what's happening day by day. Uh, the 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 organizing, who was who was doing it, who was who were the, who the players were, how they how they met each other, how they got going, uh, but also uh, um, you know the, the repression and the resistance to it from the LAPD. I'll get back to that in a minute, but it's. Um, and I know that you have talked about it as a movement history. You talk about it as a movement history uh, of the 60s. 
But it's really much more than that, because in every case, you kind of have to go back when you're talking about housing issues, you go back to the 40s. Um, and th through the 50s, and you and you tell the history. In some cases, you go back to the 20s in Los Angeles, move the story for from the 20s. So it's a it's a it's a it's a very large history of Los Angeles, not just of the movement, of the, of so social life in Los Angeles. Well, uh, my model uh, for this is actually military history. Uh, <laughs> because every battle has a possible alternative. Uh, outcome. The actual outcome changes the balance of forces on a battlefield. It dictates new tactics, new strategies. So John and I were particularly concerned to enter the minds of activists of that decade and see how they strategize uh, the next step in, in, in the struggle. It became clear that there were three or four major uh, battles or turning points. One of them was the creation of the United Civil Rights Movement in Los Angeles in 1963, which grew out of uh, responses to the great struggle going on in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, this brought literally every, every activist force in the black community together. And uh, it was a failure. So that ended a period when uh, people believed that a Southern-style civil rights movement could actually open up jobs and housing and uh, get kids into better schools in L.A. It was followed uh, after considerable white backlash by the Watts uh, Rebellion in 1965, out of which uh, was created a new basis for uh, black unity. Uh, the, uh, the Black Congress, it was called. Forgotten today, but at one point it united every young radical in the black uh, community. And it took place within the context of what was probably the most important cultural event in LA in that whole decade. Uh, the Watts Renaissance that maybe we can talk about later. And then, after uh, an extraordinary period from kind of 66 to beginning of 69, an extraordinary period in which the movement was largely uh, the creation of high school students. Not just the East Side blowouts, but a general strike amongst black high schools and, and junior high schools. You finally came to the 1969 campaign, which John writes about uh, in the book, where Tom Bradley, three uh, uh, pull up to the eve of the election when Los Angeles' right-wing populist mayor turned into the local version of George Wallace and launched one of the dirtiest racist uh, attacks anybody had ever seen in L.A. So Bradley lost. Bradley, who represented uh, a nascent coalition of the liberal West Side, the black community, and other progressive forces. And that really closed down any possibility for peaceful reform. It also opened the door to a coordinated campaign uh, to destroy movement organizations, above all the Black Panther Party, that also ended up attacking the Chicano Moratorium, uh, which was the most successful working class protest uh, uh, against the war. So people were constantly seeking uh, opportunities and new paths uh, to continue the struggle for, for equal rights and justice in Los Angeles, but they keep, kept running up against the monolith of coordinated law enforcement repression, and that in turn orchestrated or allowed by, uh, by higher forces. Uh, this is, of course, the period of, uh, at the end of the 60s, the period of the major uh, Republican counter-revolution led by uh, Ronald Reagan. John, did you want to add to that? Good. Well, it is, um, the, the other striking chapter here is uh, uh, the student movement in L.A., as Mike says, was these very young kids. I didn't realize, really, till I read 
uh, Mike's chapters on this, just how young these activists were. The college activism scene in Los Angeles was not based at uh, the big public university or the big private university, as it was in a lot of other places. I, uh, I think a lot of people had no idea that uh, a, a new state college at the far western end of the valley, then it was called Valley State, today it's a big place, Cal State Northridge, had the largest mass arrest of anywhere in the anti-war movement in Southern California and the largest felony prosecution of black radicals anywhere in the United States in the 60s. Uh, so over 1,700 felony charges were brought by the LA district attorney against uh, two dozen black student union members who were seeking a black studies movement, uh, uh, you know, like blacks everywhere uh, in America who had for a couple of hours occupied the president's office there. And those trials consumed the campus for uh, months after that. Um, all, the, the largest mass arrest included Mike Davis. Yeah, and I'll never forget uh riding on the uh, police bus to jail and all the young women were singing hey jude uh one thing one thing that you can never forget about that period or other periods of, of insurgent struggle is how brave most people are ordinary people are or the kind of spirit that existed then i mean these were People you'd never expect turned out to be absolutely uh, fearless. Uh, I don't count myself amongst the ranks, so because I was scared to death for, you know, for years. Hey Jude, hey Jude, don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh, it's interesting because there there is a lot, this is a, a movement history, so a lot of it is about institutions and nascent institutions, new, you know, institutions trying to be born. Um, but a, lo a lot of it is about individual actors and individual heroism. And then one of the early stories in the book, one of the early stories in the decade is uh, the story of Lena Horne's ashtray. <laughs> the, the wonderful Lena Horn, who was out for dinner with her husband at this crazy but highly popular tiki restaurant on the west side, when a white guy complained very loudly that this N woman was getting served ahead of him. And she turned around and cold cocked him with everything she could get her hands on the ashtray, a, a hurricane light, and. and um, events, each of these organizations came up against um, the repression of law enforcement. And that is of two sorts. That's so two major, major law enforcement institutions. One is the LAPD, and the other is the FBI. And they had very different kinds of impact um, on the movement. Um, I, I said to John the other day that uh, as I was reading the book, it started to appear to me that the uh, the kind of um, the the unlikely hero of the book is uh, William Parker. Um, he, he, somehow, everything he did strengthened movements um, left and right. The the the, uh, the, the the teen riots um, would not have been as as large as they were if it weren't for the LAPD. The uh, the gay liberation movement might not have taken off the way it did without the LAPD's repression and, and oppression and violence. Um, the uh, the West Side liberals um, kind of joined the movement in a sense because of LAPD violence. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a way in which uh, Parker was uh, was working against against his own ends, but. Um, First of all, tell us tell us something about William William Parker as a as a as a person and as a force. Well, Parker uh, was an extraordinary entrepreneur uh, who, very early on, uh, in the period when he was still a young officer in one of the most corrupt police departments uh, in the country had discovered the value of, of, of propaganda and uh, imagery. And after he returned from World War II, where he'd been a uh, major advisor during the occupation of, uh, <clears throat> of, of Europe, 
he came back and forged an alliance with Hollywood, out of which came Dragnet, the most popular TV show, I would imagine, of the entire uh, 1950s. And there was a, a young cop named Gene Roddenberry, uh, who played a key role in, in maintaining this alliance between television and, uh, and the LAPD. And I think probably people know what happened to Gene Roddenberry in uh, later years. Parker was supposedly the face of honesty and anti-corruption in the police, which really wasn't true at all. But this was the public image he grew him, while secretly, just like Jedgar Hoover, who we actually hated, the, the FBI and the LAPD were, you know, were spying on each other as they were both spying on, uh, 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 you know, the left. But Parker had accumulated uh, this file cabinet full of information. Uh, about the after dark habits of virtually everybody in Los Angeles politics about other relations and use that against all his political opponents or even against his political allies to ensure uh, that he got his way. This is, of course, exactly what Jed River was doing against the, uh, the White House in the Kennedy years. And this even extended under his successors. All of his successors basically being the, bearing the same genes as Parker uh, were using it as late as uh, the mid 1970s uh, when they created uh, a scandal to force out of office a guy named Maury Wiener, who in uh, Bradley's second successful campaign in 1973 is really the progressive voice of the administration. He's a very important, in many ways, very noble figure in L.A. politics. And uh, the LAPD, I'm trying to remember, it was, uh, this is after Chief Davis, I think. But anyway, they destroyed him. They exposed him in a, a, a movie theater, supposedly uh, groping the uh, cop. What is that noise coming from? That's my little dinger, um, and, and which is giving me uh, messages about people that are asking questions um, uh, on YouTube. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to those in a minute. I thought I had turned my my dinger off, but apparently I did not. Um, <laughs> Can I say one thing about the LAPD? Yes, Tom, please. You're absolutely right that that's the the one institution that unites pretty much everything in the book, even the women's movement, you'd think, what would the cops have against the women's movement? But LA had w one of the first women's self-help health clinics on Crenshaw Boulevard. They were raided by the LAPD, arrested for practicing medicine without a license. And Carol Downer was put on trial. Her crime was prescribing yogurt for yeast infections. Uh, this became a cause celeb, um, and uh, she was found not guilty by a jury of her peers. There's a much less uh, happy story, but with a quite a heroic ending. Um, police departments all over the country were attacking Black Panther offices and killing them. Chicago, most notoriously, Fred Hampton was killed while he slept by the Chicago police, <clears throat> and the LA Panthers knew you know, it was only a matter of time until they would be next. Um, they fortified uh, their office in South LA. And I remember uh, getting a call at, I don't know, 11 o'clock uh, uh, one night saying, the Panthers think this is the night the LAPD is going to come to kill them. And they want their white friends to come down and be witnesses. So we all hopped in our cars, rushed down to South Central. And there were, I don't know, 50 or 100 or something like that, white radicals in the middle of the night. Uh, I'd never been in South Central in the middle of the night before, so this was a new experience for me. And, and the cops did show up. They declared us an unlawful assembly and ordered us to disperse. Uh, we figured, well, we could get arrested here or we could go home, so we all went home. And they didn't attack that night. They attacked... A couple of days later at dawn, Mike knows a lot about this because he was he was pretty close 
to the Panthers and especially to Angela Davis, who showed up that at dawn that morning outside uh, to, to help uh, organize the neighbors. But they never succeeded in killing the Panthers that night. Mike, why don't you tell about the, the fortifications that held out? <laughs> well, I mean, they knew it was coming. And uh, the, the Panthers in the office, except for one older guy, they're all teenagers. These are just kids. And they know they're going to be attacked. What they don't know is that the dawn attack would be led. It would be the premier, uh, the LAPD's <coughs> special weapons and tactics unit. This was kind of the, the birth of SWAT. They've been training for months. But this was going to be a demonstration of uh, how effective they were in uh, putting down protests and destroying movements. And they had worked this out, war-gamed it. But the kids in the office were just extraordinary bravery. I mean, they were like Russian soldiers in Stalingrad or something. They did not give up. The police fired 5,000 rounds uh, at the building. And they held up for, I think it was, four hours. While across the street, the police were also beating, uh, beating demonstrators. Uh, this was supposed to be a massacre, but the heroism, uh, I mean, just the raw courage of those kids uh, saved their lives and, and created a really heroic memory in L.A. But I have to add one thing, uh, other thing. Because the onslaught from the LAPD, from the FBI, from the county sheriffs, and in the later 60s, especially from the district attorney's office, Evel Younger, who decided the best way to repress the movement was to indict everybody for felonies, huge number of felonies. Uh, I think he was responsible at Valley State for that too. And it just tied up people for years. But the problem wasn't just they were beating our heads. The problem was they stood between the movement and actually attacking the, the, the real institutions that underlay and, and subsidized uh, racial segregation, uh, inequality uh, that supported the war in, 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 in Vietnam. I mean, we're talking about uh, defense companies, the big banks, uh, particularly the downtown ruling clique and so on. But we were forced out in the streets. Every movement was to have to engage in these long, expensive uh, defense battles. You know, everybody was at one time or another indicted, or, you know, in, in, in jail. So we really not, it was really extremely difficult to create the kind of movement that most people wanted, the movement that went to the roots of uh, the uh, uh, inequality and oppression in, in, in Los Angeles. And of course, in battle with the LAPD, we never had a chance. Nobody had a chance. This is um, this is very frustrating because there's so much to talk about in this book. I, I, I have I have a list of, of 150 questions here, and we're not, I'm not, not going to get to three more of them. But um, the the one of the things I did want to know was that there are ways in which uh, it for me as an as an academic and an academic historian in my my earlier years, and both of you, of course, uh, spent your time in academia. Um, uh, John, you and Mike were colleagues at UC Irvine. Mike, you and I were colleagues at UC Riverside. Um, this is not an academic history. I mean, it does, it, it's doing amazing work for academic historians, but in all sorts of ways, it breaks the, the, the code of the academic historians uh, in that it is, um, it, it makes its judgments um, without hiding behind a, a kind of screen of objectivity. Um, I, the, some of the, my favorite lines in it are, um, are, are, are small. Like, uh, I, I remember at one point uh, when the police show up, uh, you call it an embarrassment of blue power. <laughs> kind of like a, a collective term. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, one, the, this one sentence was, 1966 was a grim year for social justice, but it had one bright spot. At a testimonial dinner in July, in front of hundreds of guests, Chief Barker killed over dead. <laughs> 
Mike, Mike I wrote that. People were dancing that night when they heard the news. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, but we have we have we have uh, questions from <clears throat> from uh, from the YouTube audience, and I'd like to ask you a, a, a few of those. Um, uh, because they are, um, uh, in some cases, better than mine. So we'll just we'll just go ahead and jump to those. Um, uh, someone would like to know more about the Black Student Union. Well, the Black Student Union uh, is actually a difficult subject to uh, to research. I was surprised by that, but uh, one of the people who could claim to be its founder was a a uh, Cal State LA professor named Harry Truly. And the Black Student Union uh, movement involved many of the other key actors in black liberation struggles uh, at the time. Uh, and they had a re close relationship for a period with the Black Congress, which was the uh, umbrella organization for, uh, for black radicals. And and it rapidly spread from uh, campus to campus, but it was also the site of a conflict between what had been LA's largest and most influential black radical organization, the S organization, uh, headed by Ron Karenga, and the emerging strength of the Black Panther Party. And, and one of the key events in the 60s. One of the disasters was a shooting at UCLA when two of the Panther uh, leaders, Bunchy Carter and uh, John Huggins, uh, were murdered uh, by a member of the S organization. And at the time, everybody believed this was an organized plot. But in doing research on this, I, I think that wasn't the case at all. I think Karenga was hanging out with the uh, Imamu Baraka, Leroy Jones, in uh, Newark the night this happened, and apparently went into a uh, uh, state of shock. And the two guys who were, the, the actual gunmen fled from the country, was never seen again. But the two members of us who were indicted, the Steiner brothers, uh, were, should probably have been found uh, innocent. But this remains a, a sore point, a contested point. Uh, to this day, as does the degree of police or FBI involvement uh, in the shooting. I mean, the police were at this, this time uh, following the lead of the FBI and doing everything they could to inflame uh, the differences between the two uh, organizations. Uh, just a, a flood of letters, provocative phone calls, uh, Situations that so and so was sleeping with so and so's wife, or you know that this organization was planning an assassination of members of the other organization, and tragically it was all too successful. And then it was repeated uh, at the end of the sixties by the schism that developed within the Black Panther Party between the Newton and uh, the Eldridge Cleaver wings of the party which led to a number of deaths in L.A., tore the Panthers uh, apart, basically ended the Panthers, culminated, of course, in the frame-up and arrest of Geronimo Pratt, who was a uh, leading advocate of the uh, Eldridge Cleaver faction. There were extraordinary things going on. The CIA was probably involved. Uh, the Friends of the Panthers... Uh, were an important group that included uh, a number of all Hollywood uh, writers and, and actors. And the LAPD infiltrated a guy named Jim Jarrett in it. And he was openly, you know, I'm, I'm an ex, you know, I'm an ex-soldier, I'm an ex green Gray, but I'm the one who can teach you guys how to survive. And because he was so open about it, nobody suspected he could be a cop. Cop wouldn't act like that. Cop would have long hair, come in smoking a huge reefer. But when they were finally indicted uh, to the top leaders uh, uh, for 
uh, having a box of explosives, which had put in the house of Donald Freed, playwright, uh, and went to trial. The defense asked, <clears throat> where's Jim Jarrett? And, and uh, Evel Younger turned around and said, well, you can't call him because uh, he's on a mission for the government. He's on a CIA mission somewhere, somewhere else. So our book only begins to penetrate the, you know, the web of all the government agencies involved, going right up to, of course, to the White House in this period. Well, as John knows, it's it's fairly easy to get records from the FBI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you could uh, do volume two. Um, next, next question. I, I, let John just comment on and explain uh, that. I have, I have no comment. That says it all. <laughs> I mean, it's it is a it is a horrific a horrific uh, history in that in that way. I mean, the the FBI. Uh, informants and uh, spies handing out grenades to people. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, the the level of the of violence that they perpetrated yeah. is. Well, I, and there was a, one other thing: the FBI really didn't know what was going on. They were obsessed with the what they believed that whether underground members were hiding out on Oceanfront Walk in Venice and had a grand jury investigating this, put witnesses in jail for months because they wouldn't talk. The Weather Underground was not on Oceanfront Walk in Venice and never had been. And the FBI was just totally wrong about this and, and many other things. Yeah. A couple, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. One is, how did the movements of the 60s shape L.A. politics in subsequent decades? And the second is, how did the politics of L.A. in the 60s contribute to the uneven shaping of urban development at that time? Uh, redlining the of suburbs in today. So, well, to... Like to Mike you're, the, Mike, you're the urban theorist, so why don't you take the shaping of the urban landscape here? Uh, what was the first question again? Can you repeat that, Tom? Uh, how, how did the movements of the 60s shape L.A. politics in subsequent decades? Well, L.A. was unique in the, the events of the early and mid-60s, the Watts Rebellion, and then followed by uh, what John writes about which is this incredible LAPD attack, without any excuse, just attacked a huge crowd of largely white people from the West Side, including grandmothers and little kids and so on. just indiscriminately beat everybody. Let me just say, let me just say, we're talking here in 1967, LBJ opened his re-election campaign in Los Angeles because it was such a huge... Democratic powerhouse and fundraising base with a gala, what was to be a gala fundraiser at the fanciest new hotel in Century City. Uh, 10,000 anti war demonstrators showed up to protest peacefully and march by, and they were. They were clubbed mercilessly, as Mike says, by a thousand LAPD members, and uh, white people on the West Side were not used to being clubbed by a thousand LAPD members, and that was a turning point uh, for the next decade in in LA politics. It created a, uh, it forged an interracial coalition, uh, which was, as I say, unique in, in in American politics. I can't think of another. Uh, city that had anything like what LA had. And it was this coalition backed up by continuous activism that Tom Bradley was the banner carrier for in the 1969 election. And that's why his, his defeat uh, had such profound repercussions. Now, in 1970... His defeat in 1969, right? Yeah. yeah. And and he comes back in 1973, but the movements who uh, had stood behind the, the 1969 campaign were dead or, or marginalized, and a new coalition came in being, one that allied Bradley not only with uh, West Side liberals in the movie industry and television industry, but also now. Uh, allied with the Los Angeles Times uh, and with downtown development 
uh, uh, forces. So his victory in 73 is it's entirely different from what his victory in 69 uh, when, and so you have to wait tw 20 years or more for the uh, upsurge of, of, of labor in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s to begin to see a new progressive coalition form. But 69 could have opened up a, an alternative history for Los Angeles. Here's, here's a question that I think is, I, I'm, I'm glad we got because I, I, it's something that was on my list uh, as well. Uh, everybody knows about Stonewall, um, uh, but uh, the first um, uh, major action uh, against police repression uh, by the LGBT community and the first gay pride parade are both, um, were both in LA. And the question is, you know, what's the relationship between the LGBT movement and the LAPD? What kind of actions did the LGBT movement carry out? Um, yeah, it is a little known fact that two years before Stonewall, um, the, the gay movement in LA took form around a police bust at a gay bar, the Black Cat Bar in Silver Lake, uh, was raided by the police on New Year's Eve. <clears throat> The crime, kissing in public, which is against the law, uh, was against the law for men to do and at the, at the time. But there was an organized picket line uh, a month later, uh, two years before Stonewall. It happened to coincide with one of Mike's uh, original chapters for this book, uh, the Sunset Strip uh, so-called teeny bopper riots um, were Endorsed, endorsed by the gay pride marchers outside um, the Black Cat Bar that day. The organizations that came out of that, the publications that came out of that led to organizing the first gay pride parade that was official and licensed down Hollywood Boulevard. Um, so, you know, uh, why this happened in LA before it happened in Newark is a very interesting question, and it has to do with this fact that Mike was talking about beforehand, that the, the, um, the gay bars of New York, this is all Martin Duberman's theory, the gay bars of New York were controlled by the mafia and paid off the corrupt LAPD. The gay bars of LA could not pay off the LAPD because they had been cleaned up by Bill Parker. Uh, so there was a much more um, openly antagonistic uh, relationship in L.A. that gave birth to a protest movement uh, sooner. It's a little-known chapter, but a very important one. And add to this, which John talks about in, in this chapter as well, <clears throat> and a major point we try and make in the book is, unlike so many other places, the old left, as it was called, was alive and well and influential influential in, in Los Angeles. And LA had a group of gay communists, uh, most of them kicked out of the party in the late 40s or the early 50s, who brought all the organizational skills of the 1930s and the concept of building broad alliances into building the gay movement. Harry Hay is the most important, but I also remember uh, Morris Kite. Morris was uh, an ex-communist, uh, used to come into the left-wing bookstore I ran and, and rag my ass constantly uh, about why we weren't supporting uh, uh, gay rights. So you had a radical leadership that I think was probably different from the case of the early gay movement in New York City. And, uh, and the, uh, the next question is about the LA Free Press. Ah, <laughs> I think you take the lead on this one, John. Well, LA Free Press is, uh, was the first and, and, and biggest of the so-called underground press of the 60s. Um, Art Kunkin, the editor, it was another one of these people who came out of the old left that Mike is talking about, not the CP, but he was, a, he was in the SWP and then, then the Socialist Party. He was a little bit older than the rest of us. Uh, and he he uh, he built a at its height. It was 64 pages of uh, original reporting. They did serious reporting. They're reporting on the. They were the only uh, you know newspaper 
that people like uh, that like me uh, read that had actual reporting by black people about the Watts uprising. The LA the LA Times was horrible. Um, the LA Free Press uh, really made its its fame uh, off of its uh, breakthrough reporting on on the Watts uprising. Um, published amazing people, you know. They published Herbert Marcuse. They uh, they published John Paul Sartre. They published Susan Sontag, um, and all the other the, and the usual stuff that was in the underground press. Doctor Hippocrates, the dope advice doctor, and and so on. Uh, but it was run like a professional newspaper. It wasn't a it wasn't really a new left collective uh, at all. And um, they had their own battles with the LAPD, and eventually they were indicted for publishing the names of undercover agents. And the, they were put out of business, basically, by, by the uh, Evel Younger and the LAPD for publishing a list of names of uh, undercover uh, cops. Um, but they were really a tremendously important to part of the scene in L.A. in the 60s. There, uh, th this... Uh one question that I that I think um, I mean you do you do actually talk about it briefly um, in, in your introduction, but uh, there's so much rich history of LA in the '60s. What did you feel you had to leave out? Well, I think the the most important thing that we left out is that Los Angeles, of course, is just the center uh, of sprawling and almost infinitely multifaceted universe of communities and smaller cities and suburbs. And really some of the most significant struggles of the decade took place in, for instance, a, a huge battle at Cal State Fullerton in, in Orange County that led to mass arrests or years of battles between black students seeking full integration of Pasadena schools, uh, also in San Bernardino, which was uh, a cauldron of protest and police violence through the entire period. And of course, here where I am in, in, in San Diego. And our original ambition was to encompass all of that and not have just a LA-centric viewpoint. But that proved impossible in terms of the scope of what we were doing and, and the fact that this book was growing uh, uh, larger every day. It's kind of like the, I don't know if uh, anybody who read uh, uh, the great novel uh, uh, where Los Angeles, the guy in Los Angeles feeds a miracle drug. It was written by the great Ward Moore, who's the leftist. Feeds a miracle drug to some crabgrass. And pretty soon the, the city swallowed up by, by this monstrous grass that never keeps going. And so our, our, our lawn began to look a little monstrous. Uh, by the time. So, you know, we leave, we leave the other stories to, to younger people, younger historians, but they remain as essential as any of the events we talk about in the book. And can I just list a couple of other things that we write about? We, yeah. I, I really regret that we didn't have anything about the Teamster Wildcat strike. Mike himself was a big activist in the Teamster Wildcat strike. We didn't write about GI organizing. A lot of people were from Fort Worth, Camp Pendleton, south of LA, was a big center of GI organizing. Uh, we didn't write. A, we we didn't include our chapter on the Artist Peace Tower about the the um, anti-war movement among um, LA artists. So there's a lot of things we we feel bad about about leaving out, but you know, 800 pages, probably enough, probably enough. It's large. So, but anybody who claims that this is, is a definity account or even a comprehensive account <laughs> uh, is wrong. We just laid a big cornerstone. Uh, yeah. To, in order that other people can help us rediscover this this decade. And then uh, one one last question, um, and it's and it and it's part of what uh, what I wanted to ask you as well, because I I noticed two two things towards the end. One is uh, you quote Joyce Kosloff, who was important in the in the women's movement um, through this period, um, 
she said in kind of in, in retrospective um, look at the era, she said, the world doesn't change that fast, but we did change some things. Um, and then you also have in the, in the, in the, um, in one of the final chapters, uh, a report, um, I can't remember who did it, maybe it was Time Magazine, who went to look at uh, Watts in 1975 and concluded that Watts in 1975 was in worse shape than it was in 1965. So one of the questions uh, is, what's the, what, what, what do activists today have to learn from the, the, the kind of mutual aid um, projects um, especially um, even under, uh, under something like COVID, um, uh, the, the questioner asks um, where the government has failed us. What, 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 do we, what do we learn? John, you want to go first? Mike, Mike, I want you yeah. to do this. Okay. I mean, the point is that none of the movements were successful. Uh, we suffered huge defeats. Uh, which allowed the exclusion of a whole other generation of black kids and uh, uh, brown kids, Asian kids, uh, from full participation in the possibilities of, of Southern California. But in the epilogue to the book, we point out that the, uh, the big teacher strike was last year, right? Or was it in 2018? Last, last year. year. Last, last year. year. Mm -hmm. If this strike is conducted, is, it was fought over the very same issues that kids and teachers were struggling about in the mid-1960s. The same overcrowded classrooms, the same dilapidated physical plant, the same practices of discouraging kids of color to have ambitions to, to go to universities, fighting over the, you know, over the same battles, but that in turn uh, creates something of a profound link between the struggles of the 60s and today. In its absence, if victories had been won and things had turned out different, in the 60s, it wouldn't be important to go back and revisit them. Uh, in ways, but the struggle is continuous, uh, it's constant, and a new generation now has, uh, uh, has picked up uh, the reins, and our only hope is that the book would be something they could find, find useful, because although there haven't been other histories of the 60s written in Los Angeles, there's a profound culture of memory, as both of us discovered uh, amongst our students uh, whose parents were in the farm workers movement. It may, their grandparents may have been at, uh, you know, a century, uh, century city. Below the surface, that continuity still exists. It, it's, uh, I, know it's, I know it's a comprehensive book. I know it's not a, uh, it's, um, it is an, an, an amazing book. Uh, it's, uh, Set the Night on Fire, L.A. in the 60s. Um, Mike Davis, uh, John, John I, we didn't get to talk about the photographs. There are uh, four or five sections of, uh, of, uh, of photographs in the middle of the book that are amazing as well. Um, uh, help, help with the art of memory for those of us who weren't there. Um, and uh, and just, uh, just, just an amazing book. It's, been, it was, it's a pleasure to read and a pleasure to talk to you guys about it. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Guys, this was great. Um, um, yeah, someone suggested in the comments that we might do a reading group for this, and I think that's a, a great idea. So maybe we will take you up on that suggestion. Um, so yeah, Set the Night on Fire, published today. Congrats to you both. Um, and it's available through versobooks.com, anywhere you get your books. Right now, we also recommend Bookshop which allows you to purchase books directly through independent bookstores, which are affected greatly by COVID. So shout out to Bookshop, doing the good work. Um, and also thank you to Los Angeles Review of Books for sponsoring this event and to Tom for his time um, and his support of this book. So thank you all. My pleasure. All right, have a great night. 
Thanks, guys. <laughs> what do I do now? How do I get out of here? <laughs>